Well, welcome to Church Online. My name is Pete, pastor here at City on the Hill, and it's a joy to welcome you uh, to City on the Hill's Church Online broadcast. I'm actually in my favourite fishing spot, and from here I'm going to be taking you to one of my favourite parts of the Bible. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, an extraordinarily warm welcome to you. It's great to have you connecting, and maybe you haven't yet got a relationship with God, and my prayer as we go on this journey together is that God will meet with you, and He can change your life for the better. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day that you are alive. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rising again. Thank you, God, you're with us. Thank you, you're a great and marvellous God. We invite you to meet with us. We invite you to speak to us. As we turn to the Bible, I pray you'd inspire our thoughts. As we start this new series looking at church history, I pray that you'd impact us with big thoughts, inspire us with history about what you want to do in our lives and in the future. God, I pray, meet with everyone just now. Speak, encourage, build up. We welcome you just now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, there was a, there was a guy and he was from the city and he was walking through the countryside and he saw a farmer and the farmer was whistling and this dog was just incredible. The dog was ran over, rounded up all the sheep, herded them into a pen and then with its paw, closed the latch of the pen. The, the, the guy from the city was looking on thinking, that is an incredible dog you've got. That's amazing. What's your dog's name? And the farmer said, the farmer was a bit forgetful. He said, what's that, what's that flower? It's like a red flower and it's got stem with thorns in it. And the, the guy from the city said, what, you mean Rose? He said, yeah, that's right. He said, Rose? He shouts to his wife, Rose, what's the name of our dog? <laughs> Remembering things is actually really important for life. And... What we're going to do is we're going to go through, over the next seven weeks, we're going to do a series on church history. In seven weeks, we're going to cover 2,000 years of church history. It's important we don't forget what God has done. Because actually looking back at what God has done empowers us and inspires our faith for what God wants to do through ordinary people like us in our lives, in our generation, and inspires us about what the future can be like, knowing that God hasn't changed and when we go to church history, the first part of church history is actually in the Bible. So the first 30 years of church history is in the book of Acts, which is from about AD 30 through to about AD 60. And in those first three decades of church history, we see the explosion of the church. And my plan in this message, very simply, is to give us an awe-inspiring overview of those first 30 years. It's just awesome. And what we're going to do is we go through this church history series on the Sundays. We're going to bring you the highlight from the period of history we're looking at. But through the week, we're going to have a lecture. And you're welcome to join us either on Zoom or it'll be on Facebook. And you can join that lecture as well. And you can catch up with the other bits that we miss out. So that's the plan. And let's remember what God has done. And the plan of action today is this. As we go through the back book of Acts, we're breaking the book of Acts, this whole book, 28 chapters, into three sections and during those three sections I'm going to be making five important points for our lives today. Section number one, Jerusalem and this is Acts chapter one all the way through to Acts chapter seven. You see the disciples had just spent three years following Jesus. It was the most awe-inspiring three years of their lives. They'd seen Jesus raise the dead, teach the multitudes, feed the thousands just with two loaves and five fish. He'd seen the most, they'd seen the most incredible things. And now Jesus had risen from the dead. He'd ascended to the Father. But before he went, he commissioned the disciples to go and make disciples. And do you know what? Not one of those disciples felt ready for that moment. Not one of them, not, not one of them thought, oh yeah, we've got this. We can do this. They fell out of their depth. And actually that's the story of church history. That all the time throughout history when God has used people, people have never felt ready. They've always felt nervous but that's caused them to depend upon God. And here's how the book of Acts opens. Acts chapter one and verse one. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. All that Jesus began to do and teach. The person who's writing Acts is a man by the name of Luke. He was a doctor. And Luke had also written his, his former book that he refers to was called the Gospel of Luke. 
And in the Gospel of Luke, he described the life and work of Jesus Christ. And now he's, and he's saying, in my former book, Theophilus, I, descri- I told you about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Began is an important word. You see, in the Gospel of Luke, we see the life of Jesus. You see how he lived, but also how he died and how he rose again on the third day. Jesus' work for us. And you need to understand today that the way you get right with God isn't by your work for God, but rather it's by his work for you. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came into the world, he came to do something for you and I. On the cross, when he shed his blood, when he died that sacrificial death, he died in your place, he died in my place. And by trusting in Jesus, you can be saved, you can be forgiven for all your sins, you can have a new start. And the third day he rose again, he's alive right now, and he wants to be your saviour and my saviour. So the Gospel of Luke describes what Jesus began to do. It was his work for us. But now as we go into the second thing that Luke wrote, the book of Acts, it now is about what Jesus is doing through us. Luke's gospel describes what Jesus began to do for us. Now we're looking at what Jesus is going to do through us. And that's the last 2,000 years of God's work. God has been working through ordinary people like you and like I. And it says, Luke, uh, Luke writes and says, what Jesus began to do. In other words, those first three years of ministry, those great things, when you saw those blind eyes being opened, when you saw the cripples walking, when you saw the dead people being raised, when you saw the demons being cast out, when you saw whole towns and cities being turned around through the life and ministry of Jesus, that was just what Jesus began to do. And now in the book of Acts, we see what Jesus continues to do, except this time, he does it through us. And these last 2,000 years, Jesus has been working. What's Jesus doing today? Well, Jesus told us in in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, he said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What Jesus is doing today, he told us, he said, I'm going to build my church. Today he's not sitting on the throne of heaven twiddling his thumbs. For the last 2,000 years, he has been building something so magnificent, so great, the church. And he said that the gates of Hades cannot overcome it. In other words, actually, the church is the only thing on earth that can take ground back from the powers of darkness. The only thing to defeat Satan on earth is the church of Jesus Christ. The most exciting people, the most awesome environment, the church of Jesus. Imperfect, yes, but awesome and blessed by God. You know, there was a, during World War II, there was a church in Strasbourg that had, in fact, the whole town had been bombed heavily where this church was. And after the war, a stonemason was going around making repairs to try and make the town and the city back to the beauty and the significance it had before the war. And it came to a particular church, and in that church there was a graveyard, and in the graveyard there was a statue of Jesus. And the statue of Jesus underneath, it had his hands reached out like this, but because of the bombing, the hands had been shattered, and so it had a statue of Jesus without hands. And the stonemason asked the pastor of the church, so do you want me to repair the hands of Jesus? And the the pastor said, no, Instead, I want you to put a new inscription at the bottom of the statue. So leave Jesus without hands, and instead, underneath it writes, I have no hands, but your hands. And I think that's a great illustration of what the book of Acts is about. That when Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead and changed cities and towns in those three years, that was just a foretaste of what Jesus wants to do through his church in the years that have happened ever since. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I've got a new title for the book of Acts. Instead of it being called the Acts of the Apostles, I think it should be called the Acts of Jesus, or the Acts of the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Jesus. The Acts of the Holy Spirit through ordinary people like you and I. And that brings me to our first point. Presence. Point number one, presence. Listen to what it describes about in Acts chapter one, the people who were there. It says the hundred. This is the, the disciples have been told by Jesus to wait for the Holy Spirit's coming. So the, the people gathered and they waited. And this is, describes the crowd that were waiting. They went to the upstairs and to a room where they were staying. And those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, 
and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James and they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the woman and Mary the mother of Jesus along with his brothers in those days Peter stood up among the believers a group numbering about 120. It's interesting in that list there's 120 people this is the beginning of the book of Acts 120 people the movement began with 120 people we know 20 of them. I mean, it lists a number of their names there, and it mentions the, the, the mother of Jesus was there, Jesus, Mary was there, Jesus' brothers were there, and there was some other woman. And so we probably know the names of about 20 people in the 120. My question is this, who were the other hundreds? I mean, I guess they were metal workers, fishermen, maybe they were carpenters, former tax collectors, former politicians, former, a whole host of people, ordinary people, 100 people that you don't know the names of. And yet they were part, along with the heroes, the 20 heroes that we know of, Peter, James, John, Andrew, there was 100 people we didn't know of. But it says in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, Acts chapter 2 verse 4, that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't just fill the famous apostles. Who went on to do famous things. The Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus, presence of Jesus also filled the hundred people that you never know their names, ordinary people like you and I. And that's always been God's intention right through history. He wants to use the ordinary people to make a big difference. Let me share you a story from a person who, who joined our church. Actually, our church started in 1998 and by the year 2000 we had grown to maybe, I don't know, 15 people. It wasn't very huge in Edinburgh. And there was a girl who started coming along and she came to faith in Jesus in our church. She became a believer. And this is, this is her testimony to me. This is just amazing. She shared this with me recently. I'd recently left university and was trying to get a job. My friends were leaving Edinburgh by this stage and I was struggling to get work. My confidence took a battering and my usual support network was falling away around me. I began to overthink things and analyze myself. And it wasn't long before I started experiencing panic attacks and feeling lost. So a year passed and I only got worse. Before one night, I went along to a small group in the church. And during that night at the small group, there was a prophecy that came. And this was the prophecy. There is someone here who is buried under worries and troubles. Now lift those worries to me in your hands and release them. And Alison said, I literally lifted my fist in the air as directed and I opened my hands and as I did that my mind instantly went back to normal like a cloud lifting the depression lifts and my mind was clear and it changed me. Isn't that awesome? That's Alison Hannah and she married Eric and this Sunday up in Nairn in the Highlands of Scotland Alison, Eric and Bill and Izzy and others about 20 of them are starting a new church, Lighthouse Church in there, and kicks off this weekend. And here's the point I want to make. Alison was a student. She wasn't necessarily one of the great preachers in our town. She was a student battling with depression. Jesus heals her. And today, here we are, 20 or so years later, she and her husband and some friends are starting a church up in the Highlands. Why? Because it's acts of the Holy Spirit through ordinary people like you and I. I love that. The next word I've got for you is prayer. It says that in Acts chapter 1, what were they doing? What were the 120 people doing? It says in Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. It's interesting, they were praying. Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem until they received power. He told them that the Holy Spirit's going to come. He promised them. And yet, they still prayed. Isn't it strange? Jesus has told them it's going to happen. Why would they need to pray? Why do you need to pray for the very thing that God said is going to happen? And this is the key in prayer. Powerful prayer isn't praying about what you want to happen. Powerful prayer is praying about what God wants to happen. That's the key to powerful prayer. That's why he says, pray your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Powerful praying is not praying what you want. Powerful prayer is praying what God wants. And that's what they were doing. They were praying and asking God. In fact, John Wesley the famous reformer of the, 18th, of the 18th century, he said this, God does nothing but in answer to prayer. And as you go through the whole book of Acts, 
you find that prayer is a mega theme. But whenever you see church growth, whenever you see big impact, whenever you see miracles, people have been praying. So in Acts 1, the 120 people prayed. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell and came upon the church just as they prayed. In Acts 2, it says in verse 42, they continued to devote themselves to prayer. Acts chapter 3, it was when Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray. That's when they saw the crippled man healed. In Acts chapter 4, the believers prayed for courage and the whole house where they were sitting was shaken. In Acts chapter 6, the apostles gave their attention to prayer. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, as he was being stoned to death, the first martyr, was praying. In Acts chapter 9, Saul, who had just had that dramatic experience in the Damascus roads, he was praying and fasting for three days. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and Peter the apostle were praying, and the gospel comes to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 12, Peter was in prison, expecting an execution, <clears throat> but it says the church was earnestly praying for him, and God miraculously released him. Acts chapter 13, the church in Antioch, the leaders were praying, and Paul and Barnabas started their first missionary journey. Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas anointed elders for the churches with prayer. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were in a prison, and what were they doing? They were worshiping God and praying. Acts chapter 27, Paul was in a storm in the ocean. He was praying and God rescued him. Acts chapter 28, Paul was shipwrecked on Malta and he prayed for all the sick in the islands and miracles of healings were happening. Isn't that amazing? Prayer is the mega theme of the book of Acts. And by the way, prayer is the mega theme of any ministry or of any church or of any believer who sees the results. Do you know, I don't see every prayer answered, <coughs> but what I do know is as I pray, things happen. Sometimes prayer is a mystery, but I know that people who pray see big answers and churches that pray see major growth. Do you know, for four years now, myself and a whole number of pastors all around Edinburgh, the Lothians and Fife, every week for an hour, every Thursday morning, we've been calling on God for a revival to come to our nation, our city and our region. There's about 30 to 40 of us every week, pastors from Edinburgh Elam and Charlotte Chapel and St. Paul's and St. George's, Crossroads Church, All Souls Fife, Liberty Church Dunfermline, all over the nation, all over the region, we're praying and calling on God for God to do a miracle. And we believe that God acts when his people pray. So I want to encourage you, be a people of prayer. In City on a Hill, as a church, in fact, for Go Global, all the churches we're working with, twice a year we take two moments of prayer and fasting, where for a week we call on God with prayer and fasting. They come up in the first one, next one for us is in October, uh, sorry, in, in autumn, and then the next one's the beginning of the year. Why do we do that? Because we believe we take grounds on our knees. Acts chapter two, God moved in great power. The Holy Spirit came and the day of Pentecost happens. The people were empowered, God answered their prayers, the Holy Spirit fell. And it's interesting, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he declared to the people, this is what's happened. Acts chapter two, verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. And then in verse 20, he says, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Peter the Apostle stood up 2,000 years ago and quoted the prophet Joel. He said, in the last days, God will pour out his Holy Spirit. The last days. You know, the, the era between the first and second coming of Jesus is the era called the last days. We're looking back to the first coming and we're looking forward to the second coming. And the last days are bookended by the first and second comings of Jesus. What's the hallmark of the last days? Well, it says... They'll pour out the, God will pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh and they will prophesy. Some people believe, oh, that's, that was just for the early church. But it's interesting in the verses it says that God will pour out his Holy Spirit in the last days and we will prophesy. And it says, before the great and coming of our Lord. It describes that these things will end, yes, but not until Jesus has returned. The power of God is still available right up until the coming of the Lord. 
the Holy Spirit will continue to be poured out. My expectation is God's power is available for his church today. My son Michael uh, is now 18, but probably when he was about 15 or 16 years old, he went through a bit of a tough time uh, with his mental health. I don't often talk about this, but I know Michael has given me permission to share this. He really went through a crisis. He was quite frankly, I think he was depressed. He was not in a good place. He was as low as I've ever seen him. And he was uh, finding things really hard in life. And I remember praying for him and praying for him, and praying for him. But two things happened. And Michael would say that it was these two things that brought the change and brought him out of that dark place. The first thing was he got Christian counseling. Counseling is a, thank God for godly Christian counselors. Michael got Christian counseling. But the second thing that happens is that one evening when he was praying, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he started speaking in tongues. And he started praying in that God gift language and it became part of his rhythm in life. Isn't that interesting? That was the key that unlocked his soul from that dark place. I believe God continues to pour out his Holy Spirit today. And I want to encourage you to receive God's Holy Spirit's power. In fact, just where you are just now, if you're a believer, let's just pray that. Lord, thank you so much that in the last days you pour out your Holy Spirit on all flesh. And my prayer for those joining today is that God right now, pour out your Holy Spirit. Come fill us with your power. Give us those great gifts. You haven't stopped. You haven't changed. Do that today, we pray. We're open to you in Jesus' name. Power, presence of God, prayer. This brings to the next section. The first section, if you remember, was Jerusalem. Well, what happens in the next section? Next section is Judea and Samaria. And this is Acts chapters 8 to 12. What happened at the beginning of chapter 8 was this, that a dear man by the name of Stephen... He became the first martyr in the early church. Stephen was a godly leader and he was stoned to death by the mob. And it says at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, on that, great, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere, wherever they went, and Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many who had been, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Wow. The next word I want to give you, the third word is persecution. The reality is, what people were doing here is this great movement, the church had been spreading and exploding and making a huge difference in so many communities. And it became so impacting in Jerusalem that the religious leaders who had crucified Jesus now wanted to get rid of this church in Jerusalem. So just like someone trying to stamp out a fire, as they stamp out the fire, the embers from the fire start flying in all different directions. So also when the persecution was unleashed against the church in Jerusalem, people scattered, but they, wherever they went, they told people about Jesus. <coughs> and churches started all over the place. And here we see Ph Philip comes to a place called Samaria and starts preaching the gospel there. Do you know, actually, this was always God's plan. At the very beginning of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus gave us a strategy. He said this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' strategy always was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And isn't it interesting that the persecution caused God's plan to work out? I guess the people were enjoying church in Jerusalem and it took a persecution for them to get out of their comfort zone and to go into Judea and Samaria. But God used what the devil meant for bad for his purposes and his good. And I just want to say to you very simply that if you are on track with God's purpose, two things will happen. First of all, you will face persecution. You will face opposition. You do the will of God with your life. The devil doesn't like it. And he will stir up people who won't like it either. Number two, if you're doing the will of God, the devil won't like it. You'll face opposition. But number two, God will always turn for the goods whatever the devil meant for your harm. Isn't that great? Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love him 
and who are called according to his purpose. And that brings me to the next point. Point number four is proclamation. Who's doing the evangelism here? Who's telling people about Jesus here? Well, the verses we read, it says, all except the apostles were scattered. In other words, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but the ordinary believers were scattered into the surrounding regions of Judea and Samaria. It says those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So here we see ordinary people, housewives, new believers, converted priests, craftsmen, teenagers, people who worked in the local Jerusalem Starbucks, money changers. They were all scattered and distributed into the surrounding regions. And they started, what did they do? They were telling people about Jesus. They were telling people. And I want to encourage you, be someone wherever you go in, in life, at work, preach about Jesus. Don't force it down the throats, but whenever you've got an opportunity, tell someone about Jesus. In your family, tell someone about Jesus. When you're doing your hobby, tell someone about Jesus. Unless you're fishing in the middle of a lake and no one's there to talk to. <laughs> but make sure you use every opportunity. Let's tell people about Jesus. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Kandik, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This is an amazing moment where Philip is, he's in the middle of a revival. In Samaria, multitudes of people are coming to faith. The church is growing like crazy. Miracles are happening. And then God tells him, leave this revival, leave this excitement, and walk a huge distance, 60 to 100 miles into the desert <laughs> to meet one person. Wow. Just, it just shows something about the heart of God. God's not just wowed by the crowds. He's interested in the individuals. And here we see one of the, in fact, there are 18 times in the book of Acts where you see extraordinary guidance and the Holy Spirit directs his people to meet someone or to say something or to turn up at the right time at the right place. I believe, I call it a divine appointment. I believe in divine appointments. I believe that God sets up divine appointments. He brought Philip from a revival to have a divine appointment with one guy, this Ethiopian eunuch. According to history, this, this eunuch became a Christian. We see that in the Bible. And we don't know what happened to him next, but according to church history, the early church father, Arrhenius, writing in the second century, describes what happened next for this Ethiopian eunuch. He said, this man was also sent into the regions of Ethiopia to preach what he himself had believed. That this man, one man, Philip impacted one man, but this one man impacted an entire country, Ethiopia. And God knows an entire continent. Africa. I remember hearing the story of a, a guy, it was a, it was a, he was down by the beach going for a walk and the tide had washed up thousands of starfish on the shore. All across the beach there was thousands of starfish and there was one little kid on the beach picking up starfish and throwing them as hard as they could back into the ocean and uh, the, the man walked up to the, the kid and said, son, look at the thousands of starfish. Surely you don't think you can make a difference in these starfish, look at thousands of them, you can't really make much of a difference. And the kid picked up one starfish and he pointed at it and he said, I can make a difference with this one. <laughs> and he threw it back in. And it's so true. You know what, in one sense, we're daunted at the task of seeing cities that we live in, seeing the communities we live in, so many people who don't know the Lord. But actually God will lead you to one person. Like he did in the, in the book of Acts, God will just lead you to one person and God wants you to proclaim Jesus. Someone once said that if an evangelist won a thousand people to Jesus every day, it would take over 20,000 years for the world to be reached. That's pretty effective evangelism, 1,000 people a day, and yet it would take 20,000 years. However, if every disciple brought someone to faith in a year and then taught that person to do the same the next year, and then the four of them then did it with eight people, and then the eight did it with 16, it would only take 32 years for the entire planet to be reached. So I want to encourage us, just each one, reach one. Say that with me, each one, reach one. And then that brings us to the final section of the book of Acts. And this is Acts chapter 13 to chapter 28, and this section is called the ends of the earth. So the first section was Jerusalem, 
the next section to Judea and Samaria, and then the last chapters in the book of Acts refer to the ends of the earth. This was Jesus' strategy that's going to go from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. By AD 60, the end of the book of Acts, there were churches in all the major cities around the Mediterranean. And what we see is the gospel spreads through Europe, Africa and Asia in the book of Acts. The book of Acts starts in Jerusalem, the sacred centre of planet Earth, and it ends in Rome, the secular centre of planet Earth. And that's always been God's trajectory, to get out of our religious comfort zone and break out into the world around us. And you know, within 280 years of the resurrection, Christianity became the world's dominant religion with an estimated 7 million believers in the Roman Empire, which at the time had 50, 50 million people living in it. That's 7 million people who risked everything to follow Jesus. Many of them faced confiscation of their property, threats, imprisonment, or even martyrdom for their faith. And yet the movement of Jesus has, and always will, have the greatest impact and inspire courageous people to fall in love with Jesus, the one who gave everything for us. How on earth did the church spread and grow so fast? How did the gospel impact so quickly around these regions? Well, it was helped by many things, a conspiracy of factors that God knew about. It was helped by peace. In AD, sorry, in 63 BC, Rome overthrew Greece and Caesar at the time proclaimed a new era, which he called Pax Romana, which in Latin means peace in Rome. So all of a sudden, one empire ruled the whole world and there was peace. The Roman Empire brought peace. Second thing that helped the spread of the gospel was Roman roads. You see, as Rome took over the world, they brought an incredible transportation system. Where, and even to this day, you can see these amazing straight Roman roads. Combination of peace and ease of travel meant that people were able to travel around freely and the gospel spread powerfully. <clears throat> it was also helped by the strategic location of Jerusalem. There's something true about that piece of land, that land of Israel, that thin strip of land that can't be said about any other piece of land on, on anywhere else on planet Earth. It's the only place on planet Earth where three continents collide, Africa, Asia, and Europe. You see, if you're traveling between Africa, Asia, and Europe, you have to go through Israel. It became the main trade route. And if you, know, if you go to the west, you're in the Mediterranean. If you go to the east, you're in the desert. You have to travel down through that fertile crescent through the land of Israel. It was strategically placed. And you know, God knew that. It's actually interesting in Ezekiel chapter five, verse five, the prophet says, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I've set in the center of the nations with countries all around her. So how could Ezekiel, a prophet prophesying 600 years before Christ without the aid of GPS or Google Maps, how did he know Jerusalem was literally in the center of the nations where three continents collide and it's the only place on earth where that happens? Well, God knew. And God strategically did something and Jesus died in the center of the earth. He rose again in the center of the globe for every person who's ever lived and whoever will live. It's like, a, it's like a stone landing in the water and you see the ripples going out. So God did something right there in Jerusalem that was designed to impact your life and my life thousands of years later in all continents, in every background. The spread of the gospel was also helped by a common language. Alexander the Great, who had ruled over the Greek Empire, had done something on earth that hadn't happened actually since the days of the book of Genesis. He did a thing, he taught everyone one language. It was called Hellenization. He taught everyone Greek. So everyone was able to convert. They had their own languages as well. But they were able to converse in Greek and that aided the spread of the gospel. So people traveling to country to country, there was a common language. It was spread by the, the apostles, absolutely. We see the apostles going out and 18 years after the resurrection in Acts chapter 17, verse six, it says they were men who had turned the world upside down. Their impact was colossal. But you cannot forget this, folks. It wasn't just spread by the apostles. It was also spread by ordinary believers. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica and he says this, 1 Thessalonians 1, 
verse 8. Now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you and people everywhere, even to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Ikea. It was the ordinary believers who were sharing their faith, like you and I, telling people the good news about Jesus. Commercial travelers would go from city to city, town to town, and as they traveled with their commerce, they would tell people about Jesus. Many of the churches in the New Testament weren't founded by apostles. For example, the church in Rome, it wasn't planted by the apostle Paul. It wasn't planted by the apostle Peter, even though the Roman Catholic Church says it was. It was planted by, it is believed, merchants, travelers, people traveling to that center of commerce. Maybe they'd been in Jerusalem. Maybe they'd heard the gospel in Antioch, but now they travel to Rome and with it, they brought the gospel. And so folks, I want to encourage you and I in your workplace, with your family, in your community, tell people about Jesus Christ. And that brings me to my fifth and final point, purpose. According to the Time magazine, the world population at the time of the book of Acts was about 140 million people. It took 1,800 years for the world population to reach its first 1 billion people. And then in only 200 years, since the 1800s to now, the world's population has gone from 1 billion to well over 7 billion, heading towards 8 billion people. It means a huge percentage of the people who have ever lived were born in the last century. And here we are in our generation, billions of people on planet Earth, better communication skills and abilities and technologies. Here we are doing church online than we've ever had at our fingertips. And God is calling us with the same call that the early apostles have. Jesus said to them in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Ho and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This was Jesus's commission to the first disciples and it's Jesus's commission to you and to me today in 2022. So God wants us to be people of his presence. It's his presence through us. He wants to do a work through us. God wants us to be people of prayer. It's as we pray, not what we want, but what God wants, that great things happen. We've got to understand if we're going to do the will of God, we'll experience persecution. I don't know anyone who really does the will of God who doesn't face some form of opposition at some point because it's a bad devil. But thank God he turns it for the good. Point number four, we've got to be those who are given to proclamation, telling people about our faith. Don't keep it silent. Don't keep it to yourself. And then point number five, we have a purpose. City on a hill. We're committed to making disciples in our generation. We're committed to planting communities. In fact, we're committed to planting churches all over the world. On our doorstep, yes. Around Scotland, absolutely. In Europe, yes. Africa, Asia, the Americas, absolutely. And we're part of the whole army of churches around the nation and around the world who are going for the same thing. Great days are ahead. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the book of Acts. Thank you, it shows us what you can do through imperfect, ordinary people like us. And we wanna thank you that you haven't changed. Thank you, you're the God who still does miracles. You still pour out your Holy Spirit. You still give the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy. You still save souls. And Lord, you still turn around cities. You still change communities. You still change individuals' lives. And God, we glorify you as the God who hasn't changed. Today, God, we commit ourselves to you afresh, to the purpose of God in our generation. Use us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Take a moment to pray back your own response to God. While people are praying, maybe you're joining us today and you haven't yet got that relationship with Jesus. I've done my best to describe to you the exciting early days of the church on earth. And it's a movement of people, but it's a people who fell in love with God. And I want that to be your experience. I want you to be part of the greatest thing this world has ever seen, the church of Jesus Christ. But more importantly, I want you to know God, Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, 
and one who loves you more than you could ever love yourself and who has a purpose for your life. So that's you today and you're saying, I want that. I want to follow Jesus. Yeah, I might face opposition, but I'm up for it. I want to follow Jesus. Then pray this prayer with me just now. Lord God, thank you for your love for me. Jesus, today, I choose to follow you. I believe you died for me and rose again. I believe in the third day you conquered death and you're alive. Cleanse me from all my sins. Give me a new start today, I pray. I commit myself to being a follower of Jesus from this day forward. Jesus, be Lord of my life from now on. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Well, I know God has heard your prayer and uh, I would ask if this is the decision you've just made, why not take a moment? Let us know as a church that you've made that decision because we want to do everything we can to help you grow and encourage you in this new faith. God bless.